It's something like a mirror. You know, we men have to go through a certain ritual every morning. Now, it's a little bit different than the ladies. The ladies go through a ritual usually at night. I know when I first was married and the evening came on and I was tired, I said to Mrs. Johnson, well, I'm going to hit the sack. And she responded and said, I am too. Well, it took me about two uh, shakes and I was in bed. And uh, I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And no Mrs. Johnson. And I said, uh, honey, aren't you coming to bed? Oh, yes. He said, just a moment or two. Well, I said, what in the world are you doing? Well, after a while, I began to understand what women do in that after not half an hour after they decide they're going to bed. They have to get themselves all wired up. And so I understood it. And then they get unwired in the morning. Well, the men don't get wired up at night, but they sure have to get fixed up in the morning. Their hair is all disheveled and they haven't slept too well and so on. And I go into the washroom in the morning and I look in that mirror. And I want to tell you, there isn't anything very complimentary when I look in that mirror. Now, what does that mirror do for me? Does that comb my hair? Does that groom me? Does that shave my beard? No, it doesn't. That just shows me that I've got to get a shave. That just shows me what a mess I am and I've got to get fixed up. That shows me that I've got to comb my hair and I'm not fit to go out in public until I'm all taken care of. Now, the law is like a mirror. The law only shows a man how far short he's come and how much he needs. The law shows a man that all have sinned and are continually coming short of the glory of God. And there's none righteous, no, not one. And when Paul said, the life which I now live in the flesh is a life that is justified entirely apart from the deeds of the law, and it is a life that is imparted by faith alone. And you note again in our passage of Scripture here in Galatians 2 where he says in the same 16th verse, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. John 3:16. will you repeat it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed out of death and into life. How are we saved? We're saved by faith through grace, entirely apart from works. Early in my Christian ministry, I was running a boys' camp down here at Cedar Lake, Indiana. We never gave invitation to the boys in a public meeting to come forward because only too often it would be a sort of a follow-the-leader proposition and it would all come forward. And so we used to explain the way of salvation. And then we'd say, now, fellas, when you go back into your dormitory tonight, after the meeting, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart, and you know you're a sinner, and you want Jesus Christ to come in your life and save you, you can kneel right by your bunk. And when you pray, the Lord will hear you, and he'll save you. Well, one day, Pop Downey came to me, and he said, Tori, there's a young fellow here named Larry, and uh, I think he wants to talk to you. I looked at Larry, a little toe-headed Swede, 11 years of age, and I said, Larry, you want to talk to me? Yes, he did. I said, come on, we'll sit under a tree. We went over and sat under a tree together, and I saw that Larry was disturbed about his spiritual life, and I began to explain to him God's way of salvation, how indeed that all have sinned. And I said, Larry, have you sinned? Yes. Have other people sinned? Yes. And then I really put him on the spot. I said, Larry, do you think I have sinned? Well, he wasn't about to indict me, you know, and embarrass me. I said, don't be afraid, just tell me. Well, he said, yes. I said, is there anybody that hasn't sinned? No, there aren't any. Then we're all sinners in the sight of God, and if God did to us what we deserve, God would send us to hell. Yes, that was true. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
and as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And I saw that Larry was understanding the whole thing. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, Larry, if you ask Jesus Christ to come in your heart and life, will he do it? He said, yes. I said, whose child will you be? God's child. I said, what will you be then? He said, I'll be saved. I said, shall we pray? Yes, he was agreeable. Then Larry prayed. Would you like to hear what Larry said? I've never heard a prayer like it before. I've never heard a prayer like it since. This is what Larry prayed. Dear Jesus, I want to thank you that you saved me last night, and I didn't know it. Very interesting. After I had finished praying for him and with him, I said, Larry, you remember what you prayed. Now tell me that prayer over again so I've got it clear. And then he repeated, Dear Jesus, I want to thank you that you saved me last night, and I didn't know it. I understood what he was getting at, but now I wanted him to repeat it. I said, Larry, what did you mean? Oh, he said, Mr. Johnson, when you got through talking to the fellas last night, I knew I was lost, and I knew that if I died during the night, I'd, I'd go to hell. And I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to be saved from my sin. I wanted to be God's child. And so last night, I knelt there by my bunk, and I said, Jesus, I want you to come in my heart. I want you to save me. I want to be God's child. But he said, you know, Mr. Johnson, I really wasn't quite sure until you gave me those scriptures now today. And when you gave me those scriptures, then I was sure. You see, he was saved the night before, and he entered into the assurance of salvation the following morning. Oh, just as simply as it was for Larry, it can be that simple for anybody else. I recall a gentleman in the rear of the room leaving his seat in response to the invitation and walking down toward the front. As he came down, his face at first was just grim with conviction, but when he got all the way to the front, he just broke into a happy smile. And I asked him afterward, I said, Mr., I saw you coming down the aisle. You were crying in the back, and you were laughing when you got to the front. What happened? Oh, he said, I came forward to get saved, but the Lord met me before I got to the front. <laughs> Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Someone could be listening on the air right now, somewhere, and listening on the air has a hunger for God, created by the Holy Spirit, a dissatisfaction with your past, and a distrust about your future, and you want to know that you're a child of God. Right there by your radio in the home or in the car, you can bow your heart and say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Right now, I put my trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ for my sins upon the cross of Calvary, and I take him as my Savior. And just as surely as the Bible is God's inerrant word, so surely will a man know, or a boy, or a girl or woman know, that they pass out of death and into life. Paul says, the life which I now live in the flesh is a life that is justified entirely apart from the deeds of the law, and it's a life that is imparted by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a wonderful thing that you can't buy it, you can't earn it, you don't have to acquire a certain intellectual stature in order to receive it, but any man, anywhere, anytime, under any circumstance that will acknowledge the sinner in the sight of God and turn his back on his sin and turn his faith to Jesus Christ can become a child of God. The life which I now live in the flesh is a cross-centered life. And I want you to note three verses now in the epistle to the Galatians. The one in the paragraph we have under consideration, Galatians 2.20, where Paul declares, I am crucified with Christ. Then again, a parallel thought in Galatians 5.24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the lust thereof. And finally, in Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The life which I now live in the flesh 
instead of being a self-centered life, is now a cross-centered life. Instead of a life that is centered in me and my aims and my ambitions and my aspirations, it's a life that's now centered in Jesus Christ and his aims and his purposes and his aspirations for me.